All right, welcome again to your super show, The African Beat on the Voice of America. I am David Van Lee, and uh, today we have a very, very special guest, a special individual. So he's not a musician. Uh, he normally, when we were growing up, he used to play the, the, the conga. He plays the drums. He beat the shagure a little bit. And uh, what else did he do? I don't remember, but I know that he used to do a lot of Dance. Other stuff. Dance, yes. And so my guest today is Sorios Samura, the journalist. Welcome to the African Beat, sir. Thank you very much for having me, David. Good day, <laughs> sir. On a beautiful day here. In... I know, I know. Sorios Samura. When they say Sorios Samura, the world turns around. And everybody wants to turn around. Is that him? Is that the man that has got the name? So, let's talk a little bit. Somebody was asking me when I was doing a, a little Facebook Live, who is Surya Samura? <laughs> That's um, a difficult one to answer because I've never been put under the spotlight because a lot of people, I assume, which is wrong to assume as a journalist, but a lot of people know already who the name is. But um, I am just one of those... Um, young people growing up in Africa who made the choice in life that I want to give a voice to voiceless people. Because as you know, David, we grew up in Sierra Leone and we were the generation that things were extremely difficult for. We were, we were feeling like we were being oppressed because we were not having quite the kind of voice and freedom that we wanted in Sierra Leone. So I joined the theater like you to use it as a vehicle to talk for voiceless people. Uh, that's where it all started for me. And then I moved on from the art, from theater, still using the ambition to try and uh, give a voice to uh, people who are desperate. And so... I switched on Eventually to switched journalism. On, switched on and to as journalism. they say, the rest is history. Okay. Now, um, you know, I'm happy you brought up theater. So that is where I want to go. That is where I want to start. Because I want to look at the journey. You know, those years, you became a member of Taboulet Theater. And, uh, you know, we did theater together in Sierra Leone. But what was theater life like? to the life of a journalist? <laughs> um, it was everything. It was fun. It was um, hard work. It was, it was educating the people through entertainment. Uh, that's what theater was all about. That's what, in fact, attracted me because we grew up um, at a period when um, we only had one newspaper. I think if I remember well, I think it was called, um, gosh, now I'm putting Daily, myself Daily on Mail? this. No, we this own? was, it was called The Tablet. The Tablet. That was the one <laughs> newspaper that was actually taking on the wrongdoings, the governments for the wrongdoings. That was the one newspaper yes, yes, that I was agree. articulating uh, some of the the, 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 the the problems that the people were actually enduring or suffering in Sierra Leone. And so we had no other means. You know, every other avenue was shut down. And theater became that one avenue where we will be able to articulate the problems. On the stage. On the stage. And the people Challenging and the government watched. and the people were with us. Mm -hmm. And we were actually um, shaking the government because they were shaking in their shoes when we actually come up with certain plays, certain plays that get people to say, you know what, this is good. So for me, that's what theater was. It was the vehicle to empower the powerless. So, <laughs> And it was fun, man, in the those days, <laughs> yeah. When I joined Tabule, it was it was fun. I, I, and you know, you now you, you you just you just you just triggered my memory uh, of a play that we did called uh, Santibo Kiat. Santibo Kiat was a political satire that almost landed us in prison. <laughs> Well, almost. Well, David, you are almost. <laughs> I was dragged I, into a police cell, you know. Uh, because, but but Santi Bokiat basically um, referring to the big thief. The big thief. You know, and you know, that, that play that you did was mm. basically uh, pointing oh. fingers at the... At 
top brass yes. that they are big thieves. But that is what theater was doing for us. That was the, the medium that we were able. But again, it was, um, we were doing it in such a way that uh, it was a bit of fun and we were respected yes, yes. in the country. I, 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 I would say it was, it was part of our livelihood. And, you know, bringing joy to the people, putting smiles on the faces of the people. You know, but but let let's look at um, some of the plays that you did in those days, in those years. You know, I just want to I just want to bring people back a little bit. You know, <laughs> let's go back to your days with uh, um, Dele Charlie Mehi. So rest in peace. You know, uh, uh, Papa Ray. You know, uh, let let's go back. I want you to just give me a, a little rundown. You know. I always say to people, sometimes theater and even the work I do reflect the um, the world I, I grew up in. This is why sometimes uh, my journalism is a little bit easy because I have lived it. When I look at stories about poverty, when I look at stories about uh, um, oppression, I have lived it. And then I am fortunate to be living in a part of the world now where I can look after myself. So I get the balance. So with theater at the time, you know, I was born in a very, very poor, family. Things were tough, things were difficult, and we were looking for ways to articulate some of these things so that at least our families, our parents would be able to look after us. So I remember clearly, David, this play was called Bobolef. Um, I, I mean, some of us call it Boy Be Careful. Um, uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, we interpret in English. it in English. Yeah. But um, uh, it was written by Raymond de Souza George. We all call him Papare. I couldn't afford the money at the time. I, I, I actually can't tell the equivalent now, but it's less than a cent, you know, but it was five cents at the time that I, we will pay to, to actually jump. To no, jump. <laughs> to go jump over the, the fence, to go sit, to, you know, we pay the security guy, we jump over the fence and we go watch. That was the first play I watched. And I saw, that was 1977, I think. Mm. And I saw the way this young man was standing up against society in the play. But it was the songs that were captivating. It was his style that got me. And I said, oh, I want to do this. So first, it was the fun that attracted me. It was me. the fun that attracted me. You know, me. I thought, wow, the singing. And don't ask me to sing because I can't. <laughs> but I thought, I want to be like these guys. I want to do this. That's where... It it all started. But most importantly, I watched um, another play. I think it was called The Blood of a Stranger. Mm -hmm. um, um, and they took it to Festac, to Festac in 1977. 1977. Yeah. And so when I saw that play, the fact that this play was telling us a story about how the white man came to Africa, uh, and in this case, Sierra Leone was used as the, the, the fictitious country, and the white man came and, uh, um, you know, fooled us about what the diamonds are supposed to be as devil stones and things like that. And then they were stealing the diamonds. And you had a few um, um, black people who actually stood up, stood up against. against, first of all, the black, their own fellow blacks who were selling out. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started thinking... I want to do this. I want to do it. I want to um, I get part involved of what in is this going on here. because that was when I started realizing we have a voice. We can send messages, and so for me, that's how it started. And you know, did several plays and Bobolev, particularly. I, there is a play that you know. It's a dance drama. Uh, it's called Bato. And <laughs> when I get into that, where people actually feel, feel at that time that I am, I am in some cult you know, some because cult, I get cult is a business. Yes, yes, <laughs> so. yes. Bato was Bato was very powerful, <laughs> and, and and that is the thing. That is the thing about being on stage. It's like when you pass on the message, the people who are sitting right there get the feel, they feel the connection, that there is this connection between them that are sitting there and you on the stage. And, it's, and it felt so real. The acting was great. This is why I am disappointed, because this was before we started having Nollywood, you know. Uh, we, Imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tabule went to Festac mm -hmm. and they shone. And then we got the opportunity in 1983 and I was part of the team to come to Lyft to in yeah. the UK and um, Holland. You know, we went on this festival and people actually acknowledged the level of acting, how high it was. So when um, Nollywood, uh, the Nigerian uh, um, version of uh, um, Hollywood started, I just thought, 
what is happening to Sierra Leone? Because we were up there at the time. So I just felt this is going to be the next stage. We're going to move gonna from move. the stage to um, the screen. So for me, the acting was just something. And so we connect, as you rightly said, with the people because the message was there. It was strong. It was direct. It's the same language, but it was just in your face. And that was prompting people and to And that act. was exactly. You are listening to The African Beat, and my guest today is uh, Soria Samura, uh, a journalist, a filmmaker, and we'll tell you more about him, but we're just looking about what he used to be before he became that. And, you know, you talked about the transition, you know, that we were going to move from the acting into the film. Yeah. And that was what happened in your life. From the stage, there was a transition in your life that took you from that stage. And then you started using the camera to film and tell stories, very touching stories, inspiring stories, like Cry Freetown, that actually exposed the brutality of the war in our country, Sierra Leone, to the international world. And then everybody started paying attention so, tell us about that, about that line. How did you leave the stage and get to handle the camera? Because I know it was not a, a very smooth journey. Thank you very much for giving me this platform to answer that question, uh, David, because it's such an important uh, part of my journey. Um, at the moment, I'm working on my book uh, to try and explain because people see you on stage. I always say to people, you know, when they see me on, on sorry, on, on, on screen now, they oh, sorry, a samurai. And a lot of young people want to be like me. And I say to them, you know my glory, but you don't know my story. You know my story. And this is just one brief opportunity to just say a bit of the story. Like I said, I was born in a poor family and um, theatre for me was one of the way out because we were acknowledged because that's the first thing. It gave us some amount of respect when we were going on stage because in the beginning, like uh, most of what you do in Africa, they were looking down on us. They were laughing at us. They were calling us the boys, especially the politicians. That we were and dropouts. Yes, that we were dropouts. And, and we were still slowly, going to school. I know, yeah. exactly. <laughs> We're still learning. That is and the because level we of the disrespect we were facing, exactly. Mm -hmm. But then slowly, we started doing plays that would got, get their attention, and they started paying attention, and they started showing us a little bit of respect. And then, for me, it got to a stage where I still wasn't quite sure. Like you, we all used to talk, and we start looking for ways out. And then a complex, a, a theater complex um, called Lagunda was um, opened in Sierra Leone. And um, a good friend of mine, Kole Dura, Kole Dura, Dura Suma, may so rest in peace. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the one who recommended uh, for me to be employed there uh, because I used to do lights at the British Council. So I was employed there as assistant theater manager. And there was a camera in this place. And this was a period when the TV station in Sierra Leone had died. Mm, <laughs> 1983, mm, our station died. died. There was no yes. television in Sierra Leone for 10 years. And I saw the camera. There was no one covering events in Sierra Leone. And David, um, this is what they sometimes say, a touch of fortune. But, you know, you make your own luck as well. Mm -hmm. I grabbed the camera, read the manual. Nobody taught me how to use the camera. You know the story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I started um, learning how to film. I was playing movie in the place as well. It was a theater. It was for theater and for film as well. Yeah, yeah. I started looking at the films and I started practicing how shots are being done. And slowly I started um, filming. Uh, I'll pay the dance troupe to perform and I'll film. And these were the good old days in Sierra Leone. Tourists were still coming and I'll sell the films and I started making money. I got more interested. And luckily, one uh, British film producer turned up one day, said he was looking for uh, an assistant um, cameraman. He's gone round. He's seen these guys who used to work for TV. They are rusty and stuff like that. Anyway, he looked at my work and said, can you work with me? And that's how it started. I worked with this guy. We made a film. 
And then um, he gave me a bit of lessons, and then I started working for UNICEF. He recommended me to UNICEF. I started working as a cameraman. And it was at UNICEF that I asked that I need to actually hone up this um, profession. So they paid for me. But that's a long story how I managed to get. They only paid the course fee. I had to actually find the rest to go to Leeds to go study film production, editing techniques, and stuff like that. And when I finished, the war was still, the war had started. I went back. I wanted to film the war. I had a VHS camera. And um, Western broadcasters, I won't name names, they will come and take the footage and they'll say, oh, it's not too good, it's VHS. And they won't uh, pay you um, enough. So I went to the UK. I said, I want to film the country's war. Because while I was studying in the UK, I had seen the impact that footage from Kosovo was making on uh, um, the Western uh, world. And that's how the West um, and America managed to put a, a force together to go to Kosovo to help them. And we were left to stew. Yeah. Yeah. So I basically said, OK, if they want proper uh, 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 um, Footages. footage, then I have to go to the... I have to go study. So I went back to the UK and I started working to try and buy equipments, proper digital equipment to go film the war. So guess what? Um, I had to take on three jobs. I used to work in the UK 22 hours a day. I worked 22 hours and the remaining two hours <laughs> was my traveling period. Wow. For two and a half years, I raised the money that I wanted. To I bought the, all the, the, equipments. the equipment that you want. I bought my car. And I went back straight to film my country's war. So it wasn't an accident. I actually wanted, you knew it. I went there and I was, start, I was talking to the peacekeepers, Ecomog, for me to go and film with them. They were denying me. And just three months after I got to Sierra Leone, uh, the rebels invaded the city. And this and time, you, had an opportunity. you were on radio talking um, coaxing people, trying to inform them about what was going on. You guys were praying for people on radio, and we, as friends, didn't even know where each other was. But I, and you knew that they were chopping off um, beats, part, body parts of journalists. They were actually, they had a list of journalists. Yeah. Anyone with a camera will be set alight. But I made a conscious decision that I came for this. I came to film this war. They didn't. They refused to take me to the war zone. Now the rebels have come. If I'm going to die, let me die doing something. And so I took my only weapon that I had at the time, which was the, the camera. camera. And I went out, I hit the streets. And as God would have it, I was caught, of course, by the rebels, but I spent four days, you know the story, I escaped. And then I came again, joined the peacekeepers. Guess what? They too were committing the same crimes as the rebels. I had to pull off techniques to film without them knowing I'm filming them. Otherwise, I would not have filmed. And that's how I managed to get the footage okay, of Cry Free Town. Won um, the first award, and the West offered to buy the footage this is the sad beat, and I see this happening to fellow Africans. They didn't want me to tell the story. They wanted to... You did the filming. All they wanted, uh, all they wanted was the to pay me good money. And then they tell the story the the, as if they did it. As if they did it. So I refused. I said, no, this is my story. This is my city. I was there. I want to tell the story as it happened. And so when I won the award, it is out there. I basically said to them, you can have your award back. Where were you? when my people were killing each other. You were stripping over cables in Kosovo. You didn't come because this is far away Africa. I have to tell the story. I said this when I won the award. I said this when I started having meetings. And luckily, Channel 4 and CNN decided to give me a voice to tell the story. And that's how we made Cry Free Town. And, and the rest and the is rest history. Is, and, 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 and after that, after that, more has been coming. Dozens you know, of stories. Uh, uh, give, give, me, give me a little bit of, a, of your, your, your story with, with Charles Taylor in Liberia. Oh, my, oh, my, David. <laughs> don't take me down that. That's not a good memory lane. <laughs> okay, what happened was that after Cry Free Town, um, straight away, we who uh, live in the sub-region, um, we knew 
what Charles Taylor's involvement with the rebels in Sierra Leone was. And so I said to um, broadcasters, I want to start um, doing my own series. And so they agreed. Um, I, it was called Surya Samra's Africa. And um, my first story was to be uh, with Charles Taylor hmm. uh, because I said, we need to understand. You know, we have a saying in Sierra Leone, don't look at where you uh, uh, fall, look at where you tripped. Yeah, you tripped no, yeah. look don't look say look foot. Foot. So basically, uh, I just thought if we need to understand what was going on in that sub region in Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, we need to look at the source. And for me, the source was Charles Taylor. So I wanted to go back to Liberia to understand what happened. So we actually got permission and went to Liberia. And Charles Taylor agreed to give me an interview. But um, I love this job, David. I love this job. You know, we sniff around. We look hard. So I was there, and then um, I got a tip. Um, and this was what the West and, um, you know, uh, um, whether it's um, the UN, they all have been looking for the smoking gun, you know, the big cheese of what has been happening in Liberia. Uh, because remember, Charles Taylor, uh, Liberia was banned from uh, bringing arms and ammunition. You know, they were bad. So there was no uh, arms and ammunition is not meant to come to the country, only allow food. And so it, I got a tip that um, arms and ammunition were coming to Liberia um, with a, a fake boat that was um, taken from somewhere. It was swapped somewhere in Malaysia, and it's coming as a food boat. And so this person said, in fact, the boat is in now if you want to go there, A, B, C, D. Anyway, cut the story short. I went to um, the second um, city of Liberia, Buchanan. And indeed, luckily, this mayor at the time had seen Cry Free Town and he said, oh, man, I'll give you the key of the city if I knew you were coming. So I said, all I want, sir, is to just allow me, allow just to allow me to move around. So he gave the instruction, allow him. And we got to the seaport, people didn't know. And we started filming. And we filmed caches, boxes of guns, new stuff coming in. And it was being swapped with um, timber. And we suspected at the time, or we were told, but we didn't investigate that, that the timber was even saloon and timber. So it was all being loaded in this ship. So um, as we were there, I think somebody hinted, Charles Taylor, that uh, these guys were there. Man, within we, we've done six hours. We've caught everything. We've got the footage. And instruction was given for us to... I mean, the headline on the newspaper was that they were told that uh, they should find our vehicle, throw a grenade in the vehicle, and then push us into the sea. But um, in this job especially if you are a journalist on the ground, you should know how things work. When we went there, we didn't go with a regular hired vehicle. We hired a junior minister's vehicle because people were broke at the time. So while they were, whilst they were looking for a special vehicle, a special vehicle. we... Uh, we were being ushered through the checkpoints because they thought this was a junior minister in there. <laughs> <laughs> they were saluting us. So that's how we got back to the hotel. Lo and behold, I had, you know, dozens of armed guys looking for us, but they didn't even know because we left the white guys in the room. They were looking for two whites and two blacks. Left the white guys in the room. I went with two other guys. So we came in, took everything in, managed to... Uh, we, I already been told that they're looking for us. Got the tapes out handed ourselves in. But man, I wish I hadn't done that because it was Surya Samura, the headlines, versus Charles Taylor. I was tortured every day. They would put knives, um, two knives, you know, that have some hook. They would hook them on my throat every day. Every, you know, like every hour, every couple of hours, they will throw cockroaches. That was funny because uh, I grew uh, up with... You know, I was just going to say, what about those cockroaches <laughs> that were thrown at you, those big that, cockroaches? That was a joke. <laughs> you know, I said, look them. I grew up with cockroaches. But at the time, you had to pretend... Every, especially the, the cockroaches. But, you know, they were smoking my room. They were... They would bring men in who would punch me. They were actually coming with uh, um, rods and threatened to shove them inside you it was it was it was something i don't want even well, want to think um, too much about let us you know we did we did something after the walk that is called never again mm. that was never again this happened in in, not, any, not in any, any of, of our my, countries not anybody in any not of anybody. our countries yeah. yeah all right so now uh, before you know 
thank you very much for at least going through that. I know it's uh, sometimes when you talk about this, is going tough. back is very, very traumatic. But, you know, sometimes people just want to know. Like you said, people know your glory. They don't know your story. Yeah. Sometimes it's nice to just walk through it, let somebody get an understanding. Yeah. So now you are here in the U.S. So give me, tell us, what is your reason? <laughs> yeah, maybe um, Chancellor would have asked you, <laughs> what, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, I'm glad I'm here uh, for a couple of things. Um, I was invited um, in a big conference which took place in Atlanta last week uh, to uh, team up with um, the uh, National Association of Prosecutors, um, Black Prosecutors, uh, uh, you know, Black Attorney Generals, uh, Deputy Attorney Generals, over 500 of these guys. I was impressed, to be honest, first of all, yeah. to see that number of young Black um, Prosecutors, Attorney Generals, Deputy especially young women. But the idea was for us to find answers as to how to deal with um, uh, um, these international um, crimes, you know, like human trafficking, money laundry, um, um, diamond smuggling. These are all stories I have covered. So that was why they wanted me in the team to show how I do. Because, you know, um, on Channel 4 and CNN, I used to do and late I used to do um, living with series where I will do experiential type of journalism. I go into the shoe of the people, become one of them. If it's trafficking, I'm I'm gonna be trafficked. If it's hunger, like I did living with hunger in Ethiopia, I become hungry like the people. So through that, you are able to understand how the bad guys think, how they do things. So they had wanted a little bit of that, but also with Al Jazeera, I used to do um, Africa investigation investigate series where I actually go on the cover with deep, deep investigations with my colleague and us. So um, they had wanted to get a bit of that. So that was why I was there. And it was a very, very good um, conference because there are a few things that I think will come out of this. And um, the almighty America will understand perhaps how to deal with um, these people, smugglers. And also the next reason down here is that um, there is this... Um, award um, show that yeah. is being organized by SLAM. Sorry. SLAM, the Sierra Leone Association of Artists and Musicians. Yes, I yep. was going to come to that, that you're going to be honored by your people giving a lifetime achievement award for your for the work that you've done. It is amazing, uh, David. I thank God um, in my short part, my, um, career in in, 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 in international journalism, maybe 19 years now, I think I have won almost everything in, in, in journalism, you know, Emmys, BAFTAs, you name it. But I think it's different when your own people actually acknowledge. It is a shame sometimes, too, that um, they say you've got to be closer to whiteness for your people to actually yeah. appreciate you. <laughs> So, you know, it's a shame that over the years we try and um, we don't get the acknowledgement. It's when you've won Western awards that people realize that, oh, okay, he's wow. But at least if you remember, if I jog your memory, there is one theater group in Sierra Leone when I started that actually showed the appreciation when I first made my film and won very few awards by then, but I went back home and that theater group was Kailondo. Mm -hmm. You know, your group. They were the ones who called me on stage and gave me an award. And gave you an award, Acknowledge yes. what I did. Yes. But for you, for me to be in this place where I now have Sierra Leoneans, that's why when Gile um, called me and said, look, we want to give you um, Lifetime Achievement Award. He said, we know we, you've won li Lifetime Achievement Award in Colum School, um, Columbia School of Journalism, but we want to give yes, you this. your own people want yes. to give you. It is big to me. It means a lot because... Um, for the African sense, it is difficult. Sometimes we envy each other when one is making progress. But I think what SLAM is doing and a few other Salon organizations is to say, let's change this. Let's change let's that perspective. Acknowledge yes. our own. Let's support them. So for me, that's why when Gile called and said, um, uh, we want to honor you, you know, I said, what a timing. I'm coming for this. So I will stay and receive this. And of course, there you are. You said, hey, my bro, I know you're here. We need to come <laughs> so and talk about So you got to come on this. the African beach and we got to talk about something. Well, I, you know, I just want to wish you all the best. I, I, you know, if we say we're going to talk about our 
that story will mm. keep the whole day. And uh, you know, Gary and uh, and Rob will be out there. They will, <laughs> they will, there will be time for them to do their job. So we got to leave it there. But um, I just want you to know that I truly appreciate you. Uh, yes, you want to say something? I different? just I want to thank you for having me on this show, and I want to say to you that um. My next move, and this is why I'm slowing down because there are a lot of people who are saying, oh, what's happening to your films? I am convinced that I have told the stories that I call the three Ds, death, disease, and disaster. But now I'm desperately pushing with the Western broadcasters to say that's not the whole story. So it's time you and I um, to try and change the narrative of the African continent with the stories that we tell. So I'm telling you that a bit of um, those sort of stories that will tell the whole story. I'm not saying we're not going to tell um, those bad things, but we will try but and change the narrative. It's now time of to change the narratives and let's look at the good side. Yes. And let's look about what good that is coming out of Africa. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think um, I'm excited about that. I can't wait to see that. that you know, when uh, they say, when Surya Samurai is coming out, and if they say a story about Surya Samurai is coming out with a story, everybody starts thinking, oh my God, what is he coming out with again? Is it going to be another bloodbath? Is it going to be another disease? Is it going to be another fight of something? Corruption. Is it going to be corruption? But if we start looking at the good side, that is coming out of Africa, I think people will begin to look at Africa differently because we have the opportunity to tell that story. We have the opportunity to change the narrative. It doesn't mean I'm going to let off the bad guys. No, no, you, you can. You can. <laughs> we, if, we, if we're talking about the good things, we must make sure we stop the bad guys. Absolutely. You know, we have to stop the bad guys for good things to go on. Absolutely. You know, that's what we got to do. So once again, I just want you to know that I truly appreciate you coming. And thanks for the short notice that uh, you decided to come on board and be a part of this program. It is, it is a huge honor. You know, I'm not looking at um, my brother that we grew up together. I'm looking at a man that has used his talent to fight for the voiceless. A man that has used his voice, has used his energy, has, has taken every risk to make sure the world knows about what is going on in some quarters in Africa that should not be going on. So once again, thank you so much for being part of this. And uh, anytime you're here, man, anything new coming up, this is your platform. Thank you very much for hosting me. And of course, I will be calling. All right. Well, thank you so much for you out there that have been listening to us today. I told you this part of the African beat it's not on music, but it's about talking to a man, a journalist, a brother, and a friend, a theater mate. We did all this together. And so, once again, I want to thank you. Thanks to my engineers and technicians and to my friends out there who always listen to African Beat. Thank you and have a wonderful day. I'm David Vandy. On behalf of the Voice of America's African Beat, thank you and God bless. Have a nice day. <laughs>